My name is Crystal Jackson, Vice President and Agent at Barbie Jackson Insurance. Today, I will be talking to you about how to complete the application for your DOT number. If you would like more information about how to determine if you need a DOT number and where to get started, please refer to our previous video done by Caleb Jackson. To get started, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration will be the authority responsible for issuing a DOT number. On their website here, they have their overview for new applicants. We're going to get started with URS by clicking here. Okay, here is where we get started. We are a new applicant, as you are if you're watching this video. You can see up here, this little taskbar tells us our progress on completing the application, again, the application for a DOT number. Just by getting to this page, we already have a 5% head start. We are a new applicant, so we're going to click here. And then it wants to verify that we are not a robot. We're going to select all images with grass. And verify. Now that it's verified we're not a robot, we're going to click the yellow next button. This is going to start our introduction process for completing the application. This page just tells you that it will create a user ID and you will set a password. This is temporary for the application purpose, but very important that you do save it so that you can come back and access it later if you do not wish to complete the application all at one time. Feel free to pause the video if you'd like to read over any of the information here just gives more description on what to expect with the process. We're ready to go, so we're gonna click Next. Required information. If you're a corporation, whether it be an LLC, INC, S-Corp, you'll need your federal employer identification number, your EIN. If you're an individual sole proprietorship, you'll need your social security number. A Dun & Bradstreet number is only needed if applicable, and this will not apply to most. You'll also need to know the owners if in, as an individual, or the company officers and titles if an LLC or corporation. We're going to go ahead and click Next. Financial Responsibility. Applicants that are required to file financial responsibility it will be determined through the application process based on the information provided, or you may already be aware that you will need this. Again, if it's required, it will prompt you through the application. Designation of process agent notice. Certain applicants may be required to have this additional information. If you're not familiar with it, then it's not going to apply to you. And again, as it goes through the application process, if something changes, you will be notified. Click Next. Issuance of active US DOT number. You may not operate without registration and an active US DOT number. It only comes active after the registration has been granted by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, also known as FMCSA. This application will be sent to the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration for approval which will then lead you through the process of being granted an active USDOT number. At the end of the application, you will need to certify and verify the information is correct and that you have the authorization to complete the application on behalf of the company. So you will need to know your relation to the business as a sole proprietor, the owner, partnership, one of the partners, or as a corporation, one of the officers or managing members. Also, an individual who obtains power of attorney to act on behalf of the applicant may complete that as well. Click Next. Information Collection Notice. This is just letting you know that the information is private and used for the purposes of determining eligibility for a USDOT number. They estimate that it will take one hour and 20 minutes to complete the application. I found that I was able to do it between 15 and 30 minutes, depending on the information and the size of the business. It very well may take up to one hour and 20 minutes. Also, internet speed will play a factor. This video has been condensed so as to allow you to go through the information and pause as needed for information while completing. Once we get started, if you're ready to get started, click Next. And here's where we're going to start. It will create a user 
name for you. You can see here my applicant ID is user 67348. I'm going to want to make sure I write that down and you will as well. Again, this is the temporary username created for you while doing this application process. As you can see in this blue box, applicants have 30 days from the start of the application to complete the process and submit it or the information will be discarded. This will allow you to not have to sit down and do the whole application in one setting, or if you find there's information you didn't have prepared to get started, you can come back and complete it. You can go ahead and create my password. You can see it does pop up with information on what the character requirements are on the password. I'm going to verify it here. And we're going to scroll down. We need to select security questions. Once you've completed your security questions in your username and password, go ahead and click next. Application contact. This information is very important. This is where we're going to set up with who will be responsible for the corporation and for the DOT's contact for verifying information. So to start with, we're going to choose the application contact type. We're going to say a company contact. This information is extremely important when you are creating. And I want to give you an example here because this is very important as you go to apply for insurance if there's any discrepancies. For example, if I'm the owner of the company and I'm the driver and I'm the contact, I'm going to use my information. However, I may have my wife, who is not a driver of the company, but she handles all of the DOT records. When applying for insurance, any listed contact on the DOT site will show up and the insurance company underwriters are going to ask why that person is not listed as a driver. In turn, they also may require that person's driver information, i.e. date of birth and driver's license number, to verify their motor vehicle report. If you do not wish to have a third party's information inquired about, then it's best to select the company contact who's also involved in the daily operations and also a driver. You'll notice once the page is completed enough to allow you to advance to the next section, this box over here will light up yellow, letting you know that you're able to proceed. So we're going to go ahead and click Next. And now it wants the business details regarding the applicant. I do not have a Dun & Bradstreet number. If you don't, simply select No. And now we can go to the next page. Legal business name. Again, this is very important that all documentation matches up. So if you are... We're going to say ABC Trucking Inc. That is how I'm legally filed in the state of Florida with SunBiz. That is my corporation name. That is what I'm going to put here. If I were an individual or a sole proprietorship, then the applicant would be my individual name, Crystal Jackson, and then my DBA may be ABC Trucking. And again, I would select the DBA here. Since I'm a corporation, I do not have a DBA. As a corporation, you still may have a DBA. We're going to simplify this and say we don't have anything, and we're going to go ahead and click Next. You can see this does not need to be filled out. Is the applicant's principal place of business address the same as the application contact's address? So what it's asking me is the contact information, i.e. Crystal Jackson being the contact for the business, is it the same as the business? And in this case, it is, yes. And in most cases, it will be. But if that were my home address and my business was operated at a different address, these would not match. And that is okay, too. Since I said yes, it's going to pre-fill the information for me, the address 721 Ashley Drive. And I'm going to say yes. The mailing address is the same as the principal place of business. And we're going to go next. Again, it wants the telephone number for the business, which is going to be the same information I had for the contact. Your information for your business may be different than your individual contact information. It only needs at least a phone number. I recommend putting as much information as you have available for contact purposes, but 
for speeding up the process here, we're just going to go with the phone number and click next. The next thing it's going to ask me is do I have an EIN or a social security number? Again, remember, as a corporation, as an LLC, you're going to have an EIN number. If you are an individual sole proprietorship or a partnership, then it would be your social security number. Now that I've selected EIN, it wants my EIN number. So go ahead and enter your number here. And once you've completed that, click the next. Is the applicant a unit of government? So basically what this is asking us here, we a city, state, or federal branch of the government. If you are just a private company, then the answer here will be no. Form of business. Again, lots of verification here. We said that we were a corporation, so we will select that here, and it wants to know the specific state in which we are incorporated in, which in our case here will be Florida. And I am a U.S. citizen, so owned and controlled by a citizen of the United States. This application process does go through Mexico and Canada, so make sure you're selecting the right option for you. This information is different from the contact. Remember our very first screen was the contact for the business, which could be a spouse, a secretary, an office administrator, somebody involved in the business but not ownership. This screen wants to know who the owners of the business is. So if it's a sole proprietorship, it's going to be the individual name. Again, if I was Crystal Jackson, DBA, ABC Trucking, then the owner would be Crystal Jackson. In this case, I am a corporation, so it wants the officers of the corporation. And click Next. Now this is the address for the business. So if my individual address before would have been at my home, then my business may have been located out of an office. This address would be different. But in this case, um, I'm let's just say I'm operating the business out of my home, so that address will match. Next. And it's just verifying that the address is correct within the United States Postal Service. Okay, as it told us in the beginning, introduction. At the end of each section, it will give us a summary of all the information we've completed. So again, our legal business name is ABC Trucking Inc. The address for the business and the contact is the same. It's also the same as our mailing address. This will vary depending on each application situation. We've got that we're not a form of government, the name and partners. If you have more partners, it will allow you to add those in as well. And you can see that we're 22% complete with the application. And we're gonna hit next. So now we're gonna go into operation classification. Next. The first question, are we an intermodal equipment provider? These are the large shipping containers where they're gonna come off of a ship and there's the large machines that load them onto the trucks. For the purposes of this application, I'm going to be a single operator with no intermodal equipment. Will I be transporting property? Yes, I will be transporting property. So, this question reads, will the applicant receive compensation for the business of transporting the property belonging to others, i.e., am I trucking for hire? And yes, I am a trucking for hire operation. You can see the pictures do help a lot over here with describing. So Acme Inc. is paying J&I LLC to truck their property for them. What type of property will the applicant transport? This is a very important screen, so I do want to make sure to spend a little bit of time here. If you are a new venture and you are just getting started, you may not know exactly what you're going to be hauling yet because the possibilities are endless. Please do not check off every single box or every box that you could potentially be hauling. It greatly limits you when going for insurance. Remember, this information is going to be reported to the safer site. It's also going to show on a cab report that all insurance companies have access to. So if you find that you have the opportunity to haul equipment, that's it. 
you're going to be trucking equipment. And on here, you've selected household goods movers, um, hazardous materials. We can scroll down and there's several other options. As we go into this further, it's going to mean the insurance companies are going to want to rate you for those classes because they feel that's what you'll be doing. So my recommendation, it's always easier to come back here and add things later. But for now, keep it pretty concise to what you do hope to be doing the majority of the time. Again, if you're going to be doing hazardous materials, fuel, uh, flammables, etc., you're going to start there. If you're a household goods hauler, we'll go here. That's going to be your movers, etc. Exempt commodities, farm, agricultural, and then other non-hazardous -hazard freight. This is where the majority will fall into, and you'll see this is what we're going to select will have more options. Next, this is another important question. Will the applicant transport non-hazardous materials across state lines, otherwise known as interstate commerce? If you leave the state in which your operating authority is under, then you will be required to have filings, what's known as an NCS 90 filing. Depending on what you will be hauling, there could be other filings that go along with it and cargo filings, but the most common one required for crossing state lines is the NCS 90, the federal filing. Answering this question can really make a big difference, again, for what you're, you'll need for your DOT application process, as well as for your insurance. If you're planning on staying within your state, the answer to this question will be no. A lot of people, even if they're hauling in a small radius, will need to cross state lines. So we're going to say yes, we will be doing interstate commerce. Will, we, will the applicant transport their own property? I'm going to say no because most trucking operations that are for hire do not have an, a business or their own property to haul in the goods of others. This would be great if, um, again, the example here, Acme Inc. has their own trucks to get their own equipment from, say, their processing plant to the retail dealers. That would be the situation we would say no. But again, we're going to say that we're hauling for hire and we will not be transporting our own property. I said I was a trucking operation, I'm hauling property, I will not haul any passengers. If you are a limo, bus, taxi, then the answer to this question would obviously be yes and it will take you through a different set of questions. Will the applicant provide property or household goods broker services? So the question it's asking you here is will you act as a broker, meaning you will talk to the individual with the goods and set them up with a trucking company to transport the goods. I am a trucking company, so I'm going to rely on a broker to help me do that, but I myself will not be acting as a broker. If you are directly working with somebody hauling their goods, you're still not a broker. You're just an independent operator. A broker would be someone who exclusively sets it up and does no trucking with their own. Will the applicant provide freight forwarder services? So freight forwarder services is going to work as a third party. You will be picking up from somebody else, not at a location, but almost like a handoff relay person and getting the getting the property to the final destination. Most will not be a freight forwarder services. It will go from one warehouse to another warehouse, for example, directly. Will the applicant operate a cargo tank facility? Again, I'm, I'm not here, but if you are going to have tanks, you would want to answer that accordingly. Will the applicant operate as a driveway? So a driveway can be this, a truck pulling another truck almost in a bobtail fashion. It could also be someone who goes and picks up large motorhomes that can't be transported and delivers them to a facility. Driveway is an independent operation all on its own, and again, we're not going to be doing that here. It is operated as a tow, tow away. Are you a tow truck? We are not. Okay, we have now gotten into the more specific operations. You can check as many of these as you would like, but please remember that anything you check here is going to have an impact when you go to purchase your insurance. So if you may, if you're getting started, you say, I might do 
motor vehicles. I may do mobile homes. You know what? I'll probably get the opportunity to do some produce. Then, and you select each one of those, but realistically, you're only going to be doing, say, general freight, which is at a dry van container. You're doing Walmart type goods. Then a lot of this is not going to apply to you. So again, I recommend trying to pick with one to get started. You can always come back and add more later. It's very easy to do so. So for this purpose, we're going to say that we are a general freight, basically a dry van, or it could be a flatbed, but it's going to be like your consumer goods, Walmart type products. And next, we're 27% done with the application, and we're at the summary screen that's going to recap everything that we've just answered and completed. I recommend taking a look to make sure there's nothing that needs to be corrected before proceeding to the next section. Okay, now it wants to talk about the motor vehicles that we plan to operate. So you can click next here. Please provide the number of non-CMVs the applicant plans to operate. CMV is commercial motor vehicle. So if you own entity that's applied for here, again, another reason to go back to if you're an individual, that anything you own in your name would have to be considered on the application. There is another benefit for having an LLC because you can just register the vehicles used for the business under the LLC or the corporation name, and those will be the only ones that must be disclosed on this application. Non-commercial motor vehicles would be your personal auto or maybe a private passenger vehicle owned by the president of the corporation. You do have to put a number here. So I only have one commercial vehicle and I'm going to say I have zero non-commercial vehicles. Now it's, I have to put a number in for each field, but it wants to know the type of vehicle I have and how they're owned or used. So I'm going to say that I have one truck tractor and one semi-trailer that goes with it that I own. I don't have any term leased, I don't, which means I don't own them, I'm leasing them on. Trip lease would be for a specific incident or trip, and I don't have any tow driveaways or service vehicles. I also don't have any straight trucks. Through and I think the best way to do it is select what you do have and then put zeros for the rest. All right, number of vehicles that will operate in Canada or Mexico. I am not going to Canada or Mexico. I will be staying in the United States, so we'll send zero to both of those. This question, very important. It touched on it briefly. Please provide the number of commercial motor vehicles the applicant will operate solely in interstate commerce. Interstate means it will cross state lines and leave the state that you operate out of. So I'm going to say one because I already selected that I will be crossing state lines. Now it wants to know how many vehicles will operate solely in intrastate commerce, which is going to mean staying within the state that I have authority in and my authority is out of. So you could have, let's say I'm a large operation out of Florida and I have three trucks. One may do long haul or at least just longer and leave the state of Florida. So I have one that does interstate commerce and I have two that just do my local deliveries. Those would be intrastate. So you may have some that fall under either category. Remember for this purpose, I'm a one truck operation. So I have interstate and no intrastate. And you can see now here again, we've got another summary of all the information that we've inputted. We're getting there, 36% done. Now we want to get information about our drivers. What are the number of drivers who will operate as interstate, remember, crossing state lines within a 100 mile air radius or beyond a 100 air mile radius? So you may be in a part of the state that leaves, you know, you're right on the border, for example, where our office is located. I only have to drive 30 miles and I go from Florida to Alabama. So if you're in a part of that state, you may stay within a hundred mile radius, but still need to cross state lines. I'm going to say I'm doing long haul, so I need to go beyond 100 air mile radius. And I only have one driver myself. I don't have anybody else. And I could, again, have some drivers that stay within state, some that leave the state, 
etc. I have to answer that, so I'm going to put a zero there. When it says 100 air mile radius, that's also people more commonly may know as, as the crow flies. So it's not driving miles, it's air miles as the crow flies. And again, how many drivers will you have that operate solely within the state that you're in? And if you're in a large state like Florida, you know, I could stay in the state of Florida and go 500 miles and be nowhere near the other tip. So I am not, I don't have any drivers that just stay in Florida. So I'm going to say zero for both of those. What are the number of drivers with a commercial driver's license? It could also be a valid Canadian license, different classes apply, or even in Mexico. I only have one driver and I have a C, I'm going to say I have a CDL for the purposes of this application. So we're going to say one there. What are the number of drivers who will operate in Canada or Mexico? Remember, I'm not leaving the United States, so we're going to say zero to both of those. And we've now completed that section. So again, review your summary and we can continue. Based on the information that I've provided, it is telling me that I would be required to carry a minimum of $750,000 for bodily injury and property damage or $750,000 combined single limit. Now it wants information as far as the relationship with the FNCSA regulated entities. So we're going to continue into this. And if you'll notice, we've jumped up now. We're at 77% complete affiliation with others. This is very important. Does the applicant currently have or has had within the last three years of the date of filing this application relationship involving common stock, common ownership, common management, common control, or familiar relationships, or any other person or applicant for registration? What does this mean? It is asking me if I, Crystal Jackson, the officer of ABC Trucking, in the last three years, been involved in any type of ownership, management, or registration with another entity. So, for example, if I've started, I'm applying for a new DOT number, but two years ago, I owned XYZ Trucking Company. I would need to answer that question as a yes. If in the last three years you have had no other ownership in any other company or entity or management, which I have not, we can say no here. And after the summary, we're going to click next. We're almost done with the application now. The certification applies to the responses provided to this application by the applicant. You must certify to the truthfulness of statements in this application under penalty of perjury. This is where I'm going to leave you. I am doing this for purposes of helping you complete the application and will not actually be filing it, so I do not want to submit it. But what I would do is, as the authorized person for this company, my first, middle, last name, I can go ahead and do it. I just won't submit it. And then it wants you to put in the password the same one that you set at the beginning. Your title today's date. Now here's where I would select next and that would submit the application and complete go through completing the process. Again I would advise you to review everything one more time if you're uncertain of any of the information completed. I thank you for taking the time to watch this video and if you do have any questions about the application or how it may pertain to applying for insurance, please feel free to give the office a call at 850-389-2001. Thank you again.